Good. What did we talk about last time? Surprising question. Architecture, I think, uh, like quality <laughs> attributes. Architecture, we talked about Twitter, right? Um, so what was a machine learning uh, connection? Why did we talk about architecture? What kind of architectural decisions did we talk about? I think one of those was where the model should reside. Is it uh -huh. in the de device or in the cloud? Right. So kind of the deployment architecture, thinking about where to place a model and also how this constrains what kind of models we can use, right? Um, big as scripting uh, service to a microservice architecture, right? So we talked about this and we talked about telemetry one more time, which we also talked about today, right? So, right, so the overall theme was kind of thinking about um, at an architectural level, thinking about trade-offs, right? Thinking about qualities and how the system structure um, beyond just the model informs this, right? Um, so today I wanna come back to quality assurance and talk about testing and production pretty much, right? So this idea. Um, the idea is that you essentially, instead of investing all this infrastructure to test offline before you deploy it, you deploy it and then see how it's working. So um, I just want to give a little bit of context where we were, right? So we've talked about model quality and today, so testing and production tests kind of system quality, but you can also make this about model quality, right? So it works at different levels. Um, we talked about model quality before, and there was kind of this data science mindset mostly. We have a fixed data set and we are training on part of the data set and we are evaluating on another part of the data set. And we talked about a bunch of different qualities. So um, accuracy kind of for classifier was one of the basic metrics, right? We talked about many different ones, including area under the curve that had to do with kind of different thresholds and how you can co still compare this. We talked about overfitting and that to detect overfitting, you kind of want to split into a training set and a validation set, right? So you separately evaluate accuracy on both. And then if you see at some threshold uh, with some degrees of free freedom or so, the model might perform better and better on the training set, but it performs less well on the uh, validation set just because it overfits on the model, right? So this is a typical notion of how you detect overfitting or detect when to stop. And we talked more about how to do this and that you typically actually split three steps if you do uh, some hyperparameter optimization. And I had quite some question pushing around this, right? Um, if you do kind of uh, training first and validation, you use validation to tune hyperparameters. So you kind of potentially overfit on the validation set. So you keep a separate test set. And then there's potentially kind of the academic uh, challenges of what happens if you don't perform very well on the test set. So you make more changes, right? So you, you actually have a chance to overfit on the test set. Um, and there were more issues around how you split your data into testing and validation set that might lead to problems. I hadn't actually shown you the, the plot on the top, but it's kind of the idea if you have time series data, right? So you're learning some function over time and you randomly split the data into training data, red, and validation data, green. It's much easier to predict the points when you know the future right? Rather, if you train on the past and then try to predict the future, right? So it's really easy to get super optimistic results if you're doing something like this, right? Where you're evaluating on um, random past data where you already have seen future data. And so you actually have to be kind of careful of how to avoid dependencies in tests and training data that you're not learning on this. The other example that I briefly talked about, I think, is if you, there was this case study on detecting dist distracted drivers and you had multiple pictures from the same driver. So what the system was doing, it was overfitting on specific people. It realized or well, the detection on specific people was pretty good and you test it on people that you've trained on, but it wouldn't generalize to people that it had never seen before. 
right? So the system wasn't working very well in production. And if you're only ever testing on date, if you only have ever a static data set, you split it in some form and that was, that's what you're testing on, you can make all these mistakes. It's kind of hard to be really neutral, right? Um, we talked about whether it's representative and kind of ways to assume kind of critical test cases. And then this was kind of the, the last stage of how you can overfit to a test set because there's a reviewing process. So you only select the models that are performing well on a specific test set, right? So it's kind of this academic thing. And then I think some people ask me, actually a bunch of you asked me after class, um, what are you doing if I, if I, at some point evaluated my test on my test set, right? And then I kind of have looked at this, if I now train something again, because it wasn't working well, do I need a new test set, right? And how do I do this? And to be honest, I think the practical answer is, all of this is really important if you're doing academic work, right? If you're trying to um, show in a paper on a given benchmark how you're doing, but if you're working in production, if you're working on production machine learning and you have actual customers, what really matters is how well the model is doing in production. Right? Accuracy measures on a static data set is nice, but really you wanna see how it's working in production, how happy are your customers, things like this. And so the, um, and in a sense, you can think of production data as the ultimate held out evaluation data, right? Or test data. This is data that the model definitely hasn't seen before we, because it was produced after you trained the model. So you can't cheat, you can't ever have kind of dependencies between training and evaluation data, or it's only the kind of dependencies that are actually good to have, right? So if, if it's only working on the customers that's in the training data, if those are the customers that you have that you're doing prediction for, it's fine. And if you have lots of other customers that were not in the prediction data, you see that your model quality is going down, right? So if you're actually looking at testing and production, um, a lot of these issues don't happen. Still, you don't just want to test in production. Um, so there is an idea that you don't, um, this is again, essentially this picture, right? So you don't want to be stupid and just um, push stuff into production and see what happens. You want to have some confidence that what you're pushing into production is not going to be extremely terrible, right? It's not going to be much, much worse than what you have or make crazy new mistakes. So there is a role of doing some quality assurance before you're pushing things into production. I wasn't really going to talk about kind of continuous deployment today, but the, the standard practice in kind of continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline. So what companies do where they automatically and quickly push changes into production, they still tend to have a unit test, unit test in the safety net, right? So they're not automatically just pushing every change into production to everybody. They're at least running some unit tests first and see how they're doing. And then they are also rolling things out incrementally, what, we're, what you had in your reading and what we're going to talk a little bit more about today. Right? So you're trying not to be completely stupid, of course. And in the same sense, um, what we've been doing about model quality, all those testing, that's useful stuff to do before you push things into production. Right? It's not going to be the last number, but getting accuracy on the static test set, right, on your static set, uh, getting some idea of what accuracy you're aiming for is a good idea to first see, get a sanity check of whether your model is going in the right direction. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about testing and production. Um, actually, pretty much the rest of the lecture. To test in production, you need some form of feedback. And this is where we come yet another time to telemetry. Right? So there's some way of how you need to observe how your model is, in, is doing in production, how you need to have some observation. In classic deployment thing, like if Facebook deploys a new change, what they tend to look for is whether the system is crashing more frequently. Right? So this is something that they would roll back fairly quickly. Or if customers are spending way less time on their site. So they're collecting some sort of information about how the system is doing. Right, so either classic server statistics, 
or certain performance measures that they care about. With machine learning systems, that might be the same thing. We might just care about how much are people spending time on our site, or you might try to collect telemetry that's more specific to the prediction that you're making, right? More specific to the AI component. Um, so if you're, if you're changing one AI component in Facebook, for example, how are you presenting advertisement or something like this, this will probably not have a huge impact on how much time people are spending on the site. So that's maybe not, even though that's the overall metric that you might care about, you might want to collect more specific telemetry for that component. And right? so there's always a question of what kind of information can we collect about how is the entire system doing or how is the specific AI component doing? Um, and then there are a bunch of engineering challenges. How can we collect feedback without being intrusive, without harming the user experience and with managing the vast amount of data? So let me push this back to you a little bit. I, I wanna, in some cases, designing telemetry is easy and we had some, some examples and some discussions already, but I wanna want you to think about how can we collect feedback to know how well we're doing, right? So classically, we would look at accuracy or some measure like this on a fixed data set. Let's say we want to do something like this in production. And we can go through all the different case studies that we had so far, right? So let's start with uh, predicting housing prices. So we want to see how well we are predicting housing prices. We can do this on a fixed set data set, right? So we just have history data of housing prices. We trained on some, we learned, we're evaluating on some other, but how can we see how well we're doing in production? Jake? If you made predictions on houses that were currently for sale, then we can assume that those houses will be sold reasonably soon. So then once they do sell, you have um, a production label to, to check against. Right. So you're not training on houses that haven't been sold yet, right? But you can observe what gets sold and you can just see how close you're doing. Um, you may also have just the appraisal data, like how is a house priced, even if it's not sold right now, right? And see whether you would come up with a similar suggestion, right? Um, so let's say you want a profanity filter um, for blog comments or for um, YouTube comments. How are you? How do you know how you're doing there? And again, on a static data set, you typically have a labeled data set where you just have a bunch of past comments and somebody went through and labeled them all. Right. So how could you detect in production how you're doing? Daniel? Uh, you could have like a report comment button and also like a, um, for your own post, some sort of, hey, I got flagged, but I don't think this is flaggable. Please look at it. Um, some manual intervention. Right. This, is, this is interesting because you're talking about mistakes in both directions, right? And this is a common problem with telemetry data. Sometimes it's easy to get precision, but not recall or recall and not precision. You were actually talking about both directions, right? So you were talking about things that we should have found, but we haven't. For that, you have a report button and you just see how often people report something. And then you also talked about people complaining that they were flagged, even though maybe we shouldn't have flagged this. We probably shouldn't trust all of them, but uh, if somebody actually argues that this shouldn't have flagged, they put some effort into it. Um, so at least you can, manually review some of those cases, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how about the cancer case? Um, you have a scan and you set, you're detecting whether there's cancer in the image or COVID or whatever. Yeah, I think we can, uh, like, at least for the false positives part, like when we see that there is a cancer, um, we can get the person diagnosed further. And if there is no cancer, then we can probably mark it. Uh, 
but I, I'm not really certain about how do we do it for a false negative case where we have predicted that there is no cancer. Why would you send him for diagnosis then? So, so I think this is a place where you need to zoom out and think about the entire system, right? So you want the telemetry data. Is, you can get immediate impact from the doctor looking at it. Mm -hmm. right? um, they don't necessarily have the ground truth, and there are some examples where actually the AI components outperform doctors in detecting cancer. Um, they make different kinds of mistakes. But there's long-term information that you can observe. What kind of thing could you observe later in how you're doing? Anybody? So you're saying cancer, mm -hmm. but there isn't any. Well, the other way around. You're saying there is no cancer, but there's actually some. If you, uh, uh, depending on anonymity concerns, if you are able to uniquely track that patient a year or two down the line and see if they were ever diagnosed with cancer, that would give you kind of a longer turnaround but more accurate uh, label. Right. So if they actually have cancer and it's problematic, right? So even if you misdiagnose them right now, they are probably coming back pretty soon. Or worst case, there's a biopsy, right? Um, once they passed away and somebody may detect that it's cancer. And if you actually have a system with medical records where you can link this, like if this is part of a hospital system and you have access to that information, you might actually get some uh, telemetry data this way, right? Fairly precise. There's lots of privacy concerns, right? So designing telemetry is often really hard. Privacy is one of the big uh, problems. Um, what about the opposite case when you're predicting cancer and there is none? Fortunately, I think nobody here went through cancer treatment or tests. Right? So they're fairly invasive tests where they actually poke you with a long needle and, and check whether the thing where they're expecting cancer, whether those are cancer cells. It's a fairly invasive procedure. Um, and it's risky to some degree, right? So it's something that um, has side effects, but it's something that's really certain, right? So you, you if you if you poke somebody with an, kind of this needle, kind of do this what's it, biopsy, some of some procedure, right, to check this, um, you can actually check that this was a false positive, right? Uh, you want to avoid this, and then again you can see if this test was a false positive uh, and you were originally right or something like this down the line. But there are mechanisms. It's just some of these tests are expensive, and you need to convince the doctors to put this into the system or report this back to you, right? So there's again a kind of user interface design thinking about um, how to make this not very intrusive, but fairly accurate, right? But they are the simplest cases to compare with what the doctor would say, um, but there are many more cases where you can think about this. So we could go through the list, but I, I think you can do this on yourself or do this in a, in a bunch of different settings that you're thinking about. For example, in the homework assignment, I'm asking you to think about this as well. Right? And we talked about that there are a bunch of different designs. So you can just ask people, right? This is a simple design, but kind of intrusive. So you might want to avoid this or not overdo this. You can ask people to report problems, similar to what uh, Daniel was saying about kind of um, blocked profanity things. Um, there are a bunch of cases where you can just wait for a while to see, like the housing prices, right? Once the house is sold, you know what the market value would have been. Um, and you have cases, and I think we talked about this, right? Uh, where you can design the user interface in a way that it actually draws in people and encourages them to give you feedback in a way that you want this. Like in Temi, where they design a good user interface, where you actually are encouraged to stay in the user interface and fix the transcription in the place because it's such a nice experience that you can synchronize the text and the audio and it shows you where it thinks it's not right. So, so you're encouraged to edit this and, and change in here and so you get very nice telemetry 
telemetry, but it requires quite a bit of investment in thinking about how to present this to a user. Right, so lots of possible questions. And you can always just take snapshots of pictures and have experts label them. Um, in cancer, you could, it's, you need very specific experts, but you could take some snapshots of predictions that your tool made in production and have an expert verify them. So typically you need to go through these three steps. Um, you need to think of a metric. Um, so what's a, oh, you need at least three parts. You need a metric, kind of what quality are you measuring? This could just be accuracy of the model, recall and precision, for example. But very often you don't have a very good, you only have an indirect version of this, right? So you might only get uh, some feedback from some doctors, so not everything. So you can only get an approximation. Sometimes you actually even only have um, a proxy, um, proxy measures that are not, let me see, do we have an example in our list here? Um, no, I think the three cases that we talked about were actually fairly easy because you could always think about uh, recall and precision. Um, let's talk about the Spotify playlist, whether it's any good. So this is a much harder case. I don't think we could express recall precision or top K ranking or something like this, right? So it, this is much harder to collect data that maps very directly uh, to any of the metrics that we would do in an offline evaluation. You could definitely give users a list here, three songs you might like, tell me whether you like them. Right, so what Jake is writing is an example of how much percent of the time do uh, people spend on that proposed playlist, but that's not measuring directly how good the playlist is. Right. There might be many other reasons why I spend time on this, why I spend less time on this. Maybe those are all great recommendations, but I'm currently not in the mood. Right. If you would ask people kind of Skype style, um, how good was my recommendation? Even if they are not listening on this, you might get very different answers. Right. If you ask people to uh, name their top three songs in kind of a training set, right? you label this up front, you might get a very different answer. So I think in this case, what you often get are metrics that are only correlated, often weakly correlated with the model quality that you really care about. Right? So you probably um, won't get the, um, this is a ranking problem, so you probably won't get the top K rating things or precision at at five, this is kind of the metric that we looked at in, in the past, right? So if you look at the top five, how many of, of those were real, real results? Something, doesn't really matter. So you probably don't get one of those things that data scientists would use. You probably get a different kind of metric that's more about user engagement or that only tells you for the users who are using this, how are they, how happy are, or how much time are they spending on this? Right? It's not telling you directly how good your component is. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything about recall and precision, but often that's fine. Right? So when we talked about the, in the goals uh, lecture, that there are different kinds of goals. There's the organizational objectives, and then there's um, leading indicators, and there's from the user's perspective of what they are trying to achieve, and then there are the model properties. You may not be able to measure the model properties directly, Right, but you might measure something further up in the hierarchy or something that's maybe more on the user side or that, that's more related to the business perspective. Right, so this is what I'm describing down here. So sometimes you get very accurate labels for real unseen data. The housing price example is one of them. Right, so a week later or a month later, you see what the house was sold for. Um, sometimes you only know about mistakes Right, the Skype example where you report problems. So if you, users are happy, you don't know about this. Sometimes the answers are delayed. So this is in the housing example again, right? So it's very good data, but it only comes a week late or a month late. If you're predicting something, um, we talked about this with um, uh, master program admissions, right? So a lot of metrics that you would like to measure, you only know five years later, 
well, a year later, like what's the starting salary, what's the salary and the position after five years, right? So some of those things you can get, but only get much later, which is not really helping you immediately. And often you only have samples because otherwise there would be way too much data. We're going to talk about this. And often you only have weak proxies of correctness. Right? So what you need in the end is think about what can you actually measure? This might be just straightforward recall and precision or on a sample or accuracy or, or some of these traditional metrics, but it might be something like what Jake just described, the percentage of time users spend in this playlist. And this might be good enough because if you can compare with the change, whether they're spending more time than before, you might see that you're improving, right? And if that's the only thing that you changed, you might actually make a causal link that the improvement in your model, that's the thing that's improving people spending more time. So if you know what the metric is, you need to identify what kind of data you're collecting. So for in the Spotify case, whatever people are playing, right, and playing in the, so you kind of need to track all that data, you need to collect something. In the cancer case, you need to think about what kind of data can you get from the hospital and so on. And then you need to map them, right? So you need to have some way of how you figure out, how you compute the metric with the telemetry data, which is often obvious if the metric is defined, right, um, properly. So whatever you're testing in production, it's not necessarily a very accurate measure, but that's fine, right? You don't need to get accuracy or you don't need to get recall and precision. Your numbers might look very different than what you have on a static data set. What's actually way more common is that you start monitoring the system and you observe trends, right? It's not so much about what is a number, but how does a number behave over time? If, if uh, your user engagement is going down, it's a bad sign, right? If your re relative recall measure, even if it's noisy, is going down, that might be a bad sign. If the number of complaints about your profanity filter are rising, that might be a bad sign. If there's a massive jump in your metric after you release a new version, that is possibly a bad sign. Right, so kind of relative differences is much more commonly the thing that you look for. And that's the thing that you can also automate on. Maybe I should have ordered this differently. Um, you read about uh, canary releases, right? Um, kind of incrementally releasing something uh, first to a small user set and to a larger. And if this isn't behaving well, then you're rolling back. It's useful for this kind of stuff, right? So you, so you know what the metric is, the engagement metric is for most of the users. For some users, you give them the new model. And if it's performing wildly worse than the old one, then you have a problem and you want to stop, stop the release, right, or go back. So the kind of things that you're looking for are jumps after releases, right? And typically, you don't roll out everything at once. You kind of do this canary release thing that you mitigate the mistakes. Like if there's a jump that you're not hurting all your users at once, you watch for slow degradation. So if it goes down over time, that's common sign of data drift, of stale models, of feedback loops, of adversaries, right? So something is changing and somehow your model isn't keeping up with the changes. And all of this is useful also for debugging. Like if you see changes or if you see different trends in different populations, you might want to figure out uh, why are some of my users really unhappy with the uh, Spotify playlists and some users are much more happy, right? Or why is our cancer detection much worse in women than in men? Things like this. Make sense? Any questions? So for monitoring, there are lots of tools out there and I, I'm gonna have you play with this in the group assignment later, um, install some of them. There are hundreds of open source tools. Um, I think some of you, I think most teams in, in the analysis course last semester used Grafunda, which is a common dashboard. It looks something like this. Um, so it's, it's a way of plotting all kinds of data over time. 
There are dozens of these and th they are highly customizable. So what you're plotting there is something that you can plug in in different ways. Um, Prometheus, I think, is, is a tool that helps you to suck in metrics from all kinds of log files and different sources and then search from them and aggregate this. And there are a bunch of different tools and different stacks and infrastructures. I think we're going to spend some one recitation on one of these stacks. And then as part of the, the, the group project, you're going to do some testing and production. So you're going to try one of these. Um, in the end, you're always building some sort of dashboard. So this is a classic one. I think this is not machine learning related. So this is looking at how many user logins do you have? How is this behaving over time? How many signups? So that those might be leading indicators in your goals, right? Things like this uh, that you wanna, wanna see. Memory consumption, um, CPU. So those are things that you might just, for operations purposes, want to track anyway, right? You also might have that after model update suddenly inference becomes really slow. So this is something that you want to detect um, server requests. And then there are also specific mechanisms specifically for machine learning. And this is also a place where there are lots of commercial companies kind of in this ML ops space, machine learning operations, uh, lots of services like AWS will just host your models for you and they will give you some dashboards and there are a bunch of other services that will tell you this is a response time over time, how many predictions you have, uh, how many requests take more than two seconds. Like this is mostly on performance, but if you also have some telemetry, you can also easily plot the, like um, the percentage of time played uh, on the proposed playlists or something like this, right? Or the measured accuracy. So. This is a place where you really want to start thinking about collecting telemetry, visualizing this, and maybe putting in some automated steps. This is also fairly common that if there's a sudden jump in the bad direction, that you inform somebody, that you page somebody, um, or that you automatically roll back to an old version or something like this, right? Again, I've shown you this before. Telemetry is hard. Um, there are lots of problems. The most obvious one, and I think depends on, on the scenario where you're working with, privacy can be a big one, right? So when we talked about the Google Glasses scenario uh, two days ago, um, you don't want to send to the cloud whatever every of your users is seeing at any time. Maybe you don't, you want to send this, but your users probably don't want that. Right? There's lots of scenarios where you use machine learning and kind of privacy critical solutions, or you're one of those companies that actually tries to make this as a theme that they care about privacy, right? And then actually do this. Like Apple tries to differentiate themselves these days a lot by being really careful of what kind of telemetry will leave the iPhone, for example. Then there are many more challenges. Um, and again, this is similar to what we talked about two days ago, but um, a big challenge is how much data are you collecting? Like these infrastructures here, Grafando and uh, Prometheus, they are designed to scale. Like what you can put into a Kafka stream, just, just the amount of data that you can push through this is pretty amazing, right? So you build kind of big distributed systems in the cloud you can consume a huge amount of data, but you still want to think about, do you want to really have all the camera images of every person at all the time streaming into your cloud, right? Um, for cancer predictions, probably not too bad. You're probably not doing too many, but it really depends on the scenario, right? And then you probably want to sample. This was also in the reading of how you identify samples, whether you're smarter about it. Um, Especially if you're rare events, it might be hard to find them in the sample. So there are strategies about adaptive targeting, biased sampling, um, detection of rare events, right? We talked about this a little bit uh, before and kind of batching things before you upload things. Um, any questions? You want to do an exercise? 
don't see reactions one way or the other. Um, <laughs> can you vote up, down? Spend 10 minutes on an exercise? Nobody wants to vote? Nobody cares? <laughs> the people who care can't decide? Okay. I take this as a no for now. We, we do one at the end if we have time. Um, this is a, just, just for context, this is um, from the midterm or final last year, I think is one of the scenarios um, of a smart home workout system. Um, there's a lot of these systems these days where you have kind of an AI instructor um, and this is giving you feedback and you wanna see how the feedback is doing. But let's do this later if you're not up to it right now. So I think we have some time at the end. So the thing that I talked about so far is pushing something into production and monitoring how you're doing. Right? Um, there are a couple more things where you can run explicit experiments in production. That's very common. And I assume most of you have seen A-B tests in some form. Right, so this is experimenting in production. Um, this is the idea of um, essentially running what if scenarios. Right, if you have enough users, you can just show a change to some users and see how they're doing. You can also show a change to all users and see how, how they're doing. But then it's hard to say whether people, let's say you're, you're running a sale on Amazon and you're showing the same sale to all users. Now you have a hard time determining, are people buying more stuff because of the sale or are people buying more stuff because it's close to Valentine's anyway and people are just buying more stuff and they would have bought more stuff anyway. Right? So the idea of A-B testing is that you're really doing randomized controlled trials, kind of the thing that you would do for medicine testing, medical testing or so, where you divide all of your users into two groups one group get the treatment, the other group just gets the plain old version. And now if you see a difference between those groups, and that's the only difference in kind of what you're showing them, then you can make a causal argument that whatever change you made actually caused the difference in higher sales, right? It's not that it's a later date or it's a specific date in the year because that would have affected both groups equally, right? And then if you're selecting those groups randomly, you can't say that it only affects the men versus the women in some way, right? Um, it would be randomized across both groups. So if you see a consistent effect between those two groups, you can be pretty sure that the effect is due to the treatment that you're doing, right? So this is really the idea behind science, how controlled experiments work. It really allows you to not just detect correlations, but actually causation. Right, the difference is due to this change. It's not just correlating with this change, this change is causing it. Just hard to say what part of the change if, you, if the change is larger is causing something. So A-B testing has a long history for usability. Um, it's especially easy if you have online sites where you have a lot of users that come to your site. It's very hard to do as a startup if you have almost no users, right? Or, in the kind of a student project, but if you have a sufficient, a sufficient scale and enough users, it's fairly easy to, and you can collect telemetry in production, it's very easy to show some of your users a different starting page and see whether they just buy more stuff or something like this, right? So that's very common. Run In a running system, typically a web system or something that's web backed, backed up by a cloud or something, Take a random sample of X users and show them a modified version and then track outcome, have some sort of telemetry, see how you're doing. And there are lots of examples of doing this. Um, and people actually have been pushing this very far. So people, like you hear stories where Facebook experiments with the size of a button, with the color of a button, right? So something like this really, a really small change, just the background color changes. And if you just have enough users, you might actually find a difference between those changes, right? So you, if you have enough users, you can test a lot of small changes and kind of make adjustments 
adjust, uh, adjustments accordingly. So let's think about this for AI components. So let's say we're swapping out the product recommendation algorithm at Amazon. What are the kind of things that we would look for? How would we run this as an experiment? Is this too obvious? Like it? So if the new algorithm is provided to a small subset of users, we can see if uh, more items are being purchased. Mm -hmm. I mean, the recommended items um, are getting added to the cart and they're leading to more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much the same with the user interface design. It, In a sense, it is a user interface design, right? Uh, it's changing the ranking and see whether people are buying more stuff or whether they're following the links more, whether they are, are spending more time on your page adding more items to the cart, right? Um, so you can think about all kinds of metrics. You can also think about how much, how, how many servers do you need, or how much energy do you need per customer to serve them? Like how much does your throughput shrink because this component takes much more time, right? So kind of estimate the cost of prediction. Um, but yeah, I think this is fairly straightforward. So let's, Take our audio transcription service. You have a new language model. You think you're better at recognizing certain words. Um, how are you testing that in production? Yeah, um, if you look at the number of manual corrections, right, so you can just, again, just translate some audio files um, in a different way. You don't even need to divide this by user necessarily, right, so you could just do this by audio file and then see whether the kind of feedback that you're getting from some users is different from the kind of feedback that you get from other transcriptions. You can also do the five star rating thing and see whether you see a difference there. Um, Right, so whatever quality you can measure there, uh, you can just compare. And if you have an offline model for detecting faults, uh, even if the model is offline, you can probably take some sort of telemetry, um, right, where you see reports of the user, some part will be online, right, even though the actual AI component is not, but the effects of it, it will call some hotline or something, so you could look for this. Um, for fall detection, I think it's interesting because it's much harder to run an A-B experiment. Right? So you need to get, you need to identify some of your users that have these smartwatches and in some way you need to get um, your, you need to identify or get an update with the new version to some of your users or to all of your users and identify this. And then it's a fairly rare event. Right, so I think even if you have a million users, you probably only see a couple of thousand people fall a day, maybe less, I don't know. I actually have no statistics about how, how often people would fall, probably not that frequently, right? So you have fairly rare events. So you have, if you, if you have a million users and only a thousand users are in your sample group, in your treatment group, and of those thousand users, only one person falls in the next five days, Right, it's very hard to compare whether that's represent representative. So this might be a case that's actually, where it's actually very hard to run an um, A-B experiment just because you don't have a lot of events that you can, that you can analyze. Which brings me to the point about experiment size. How many users do we need and how long do we need to run an experiment? Right, so if you have a huge amount of users, you can run even tiniest experiments. And this has to do, um, let's see. Let me just very briefly, I don't wanna to spend too much time on statistics and some of you have heard this spiel before, but um, this is a place where you actually need to think a little bit about statistics, about whether the differences that you're observing are random or not. It's a classic 
result might look something like this. You have a group A and a group B. Group A has a classic recommendation model. Group B has a personalized new recommendation model. And you have, I don't know, 2000 users, 10 users get the new version. And now you're looking of how much time are people spending on your site, right? You see that the group A, the original users spend maybe three minutes, uh, 13 watching videos on your site, kind of following recommendations. And with the new recommendation model, you see three minutes, 24. This is potentially very hard to see that this is a causal change, right? The results are pretty small. And there's a chance that the results might be random. Right? Not every user will spend exactly three minutes, 13 on your page. You have some users that spend 10 seconds, some users that spend five minutes. Right? What you want to see is that on the average, the actual average is different between those groups. But the problem is that if you only have 10 users there, and among those 10 users, there was one user who just spent two hours on your page. This one user will influence the average quite a lot. Right, and whether you have one of those users in your 10 users or not is, is random, it's a chance thing, right? And the smaller the group, the more, the more unpredictable um, the, the median or the average is. So you can use the median as more robust against outliers, but still um, there's a question of how close to the real median are you? Right, so if you're just comparing the median, yes, you get much, I think you, you typically say with five measures, uh, the median that you take is the real median will be between the smallest and the largest measurement, right? That gives you a very, often a pretty narrow confidence interval. Um, typically what you want to do is use some statistics that are a bit more scalable and not so customized on this. And so how would you approach this? If you want to know that the average on one group is actually different from the average of the different group, who has a little bit of background in statistics and knows what to do here. Right, t-test is what I recommended last semester, right? So a statistical test, a statistical test is there to see whether two distributions are different. So what you typically have is something that looks like this. You have two groups, and this is a density plot. So it just says, how much time are people spending on your page between zero and, I don't know, eight minutes. And most of your users in, in one group, so some users spend two minutes, some users, more users spend four minutes, some users spend this amount of time, right? The, the mean is somewhere here for this one group, and the mean for the other group is somewhere there. And what you want to know with the statistical test is whether samples that you're drawing from these two distributions are actually coming from two different distributions, right? Whether this is distinguishable. And there are two cases how you can distinguish things easier. So one thing is if you have a bigger effect size, like if the averages are further apart, you're much more sure that they're actually different, right? So intuitively you can just look how much are these curves overlapping if they are very far apart, they are not overlapping much, you're pretty sure that they're not just samples from the same distribution. Another effect that helps is if you're pretty sure, if you have very little noise, like people always spend three minutes plus minus 10 seconds on your page, whereas sometimes people spend two minutes or 10 minutes, right? If the noise is much bigger, it's much harder to detect the difference. Does this make sense? So the idea is whether two samples that you're observing, um, you want to know, come, do they come from the same distribution or from two different distributions? And the statistical test will essentially tell you, give you some confidence measure. Like it's not precisely accurate, but with 95% chance, these come from different distributions. Right? So this is usually how people think about, or how, how to think about this. So um, this is where significant levels come in. They give you 
roughly an idea of what's if there is a difference that I'm seeing, what's the chance that this difference is entirely random? And the more samples you have, the more clearly you can rule out chance. Right? So if you have very few samples and the distributions are very similar, you're not, very you're not going to be very confident that these distributions are actually different. But if you just have millions of data points, you can find even the smallest differences. It's kind of a typical intuition, um, let me see. So uh, I don't want to ignore this. So this is, this is roughly the intuition here be, behind kind of the law of not large numbers. So if you only have very few samples, you have a very high confidence and a very large confidence interval. So the, the true value could be anywhere in this range. So this here shows, um, the confidence, so the orange line is the mean up to this point, right? So this is from one to a hundred sample. There's noise here that you see. Um, the orange line is the mean that we computed for a specific sample up to this, this size. And then the gray and the yellow line are the confidence intervals that statistics will tell us the real media, uh, the real mean will be somewhere in this range. And what we typically see is that the more samples we have, the, the mean stabilizes around some area and the confidence interval will get smaller and smaller, right? We're much more confident that the real mean is in this range. This is the more samples you have, the closer is your window and the closer, the easier you can compare to data that's very close to it. Make sense, roughly? So, in practice, I think most of the time for the kind of data that we're looking at, you want to use a t-test. There are a bunch of different statistical tests, but if you have enough data, a t-test assumes normal distribution and stuff like this, but it's typically robust if you have enough data points. So if you, in, in our settings, we typically have hundreds of data points, so most of the time the t-test will be fine. Um, so unless you have, I mean, Best case, talk to your data scientists. They hopefully know about statistics and they can help you with this, right? But um, typically use a t-test. So you add two lists of numbers, like how many, how much time did people spend on your site in one group? How much time did they spend on the other group? The confidence level that you're aiming for, the test will tell you what's the chance that these two distributions are separate. And the way to read this is a bit complicated, but it typically it tells you a p-value. And if this p-value is smaller than 5%, you kind of say it's statistically significant. That's just a convention. Roughly, it's not technically true, but roughly what this means is the chance that this difference is true just due to randomness is smaller than 5%. That's kind of what we assume as significant. If it's smaller than 5% chance that it's random, then it's probably not random. Right. So what you're doing here is whenever you have some observations, oops, um, you have two groups, where am I? You have two groups and you have lots of results for one or the other group. You're trying to compare whether these differences that you're seeing don't just produce a different average, but whether these averages are statistically significantly different, right? That you're not based on noise. And the nice thing with A-B experiments is if you, if you Google or Facebook, you have so many users that even if you make tiny changes and the effect size is tiny, you can still measure this and are often fairly confident about differences. If you only have a couple of hundred users, this will be much, much harder. You will not be able to see clear effects from very small effect sizes. You, you will only see improvements or significant improvements if you have really massive jumps in how good your predictions are doing. And so it depends a little bit about how much, how much data you have, how many people you have and so on. All right. And there are also some power statistics, but I assume you're not going to use them that tell you if I'm expecting a difference of like, I'm expecting my model to improve accuracy by 2%, how many users do it? And this is roughly the noise. This is the distribution, how 
how much does it differ between user to user, how much time they're spending on my page. You can compute with power statistics, how many users do I roughly need in my experiment to be able to show a difference if a difference actually exists. Right? The key term here is power statistics. There are some tools online to look this up. Um, in practice, many people don't do this. They just run an experiment and then see in a dashboard whether their results are significant or not. If they're not significant, they run it longer. And if they're still not significant, they give up at some point. Right, so this is, this is more, the more pragmatic thing. So just briefly, how would you implement this? Um, well, you need to have a way to run two implementations at the same time, right? You need the A group and the B group. With machine learning, it's often two kinds of models. And if we are already thinking about kind of a REST API for our machine learning thing, it's relatively easy. Just spun up two Docker containers with one version of the model here, another version of the model there, and then have a load balancer that figures out which one to call. Right? Or in your application where you're calling the model, you're just deciding if, if this is group A or group B. So the most common thing is um, that you either have two separate deployments and then a load balancer somewhere, which I think is probably what you want to do for models, or you have feature flags somewhere in your implementation, which is just, just an if statement, just says if this condition, then use this model, otherwise use that model. And one more th ingredient that you need is you need to figure out which user is in which group, right? Or if you don't have users, which translation was done with which model, right? Was in which group. And typically you need some persistent mapping, right? So you need some file somewhere that says, these are the users that in, are in my B group, in my treatment group. You can pick them randomly, but you want to remember this. It's fairly, weird for a user that every time if they reload the page, they see a different version, right? Especially if you're doing visual things. So you typically want to keep them in the group. Also, it kind of makes it fishy if you send them this recommendation once and then this recommendation the other time and the results are not immediate. You're measuring something like how long are they staying on the page? It becomes really weird about how is the measurement actually relating to the model. And then whatever telemetry you're collecting, you need to be able to, again, also figure out does, does this belong to group A or to group B. So at the implementation level, this is usually super straightforward. You have somewhere some sort of library or, or some sort of simple implementation that just says, is this feature enabled, like one click checkout or new model version for a specific user? There should be a closing parenthesis here. And then either you use one functionality or another, right? There's really just if statements there or you have this if statement somewhere in the load balancer. In a sense, it's really just Boolean options, possibly a bunch of them, and then some mapping to uh, users, right? So here I'm checking for the combination of user ID and um, this specific feature that I care about. In practice, you can either implement this yourself, it's pretty straightforward, but most of the time you might want to consider using an existing library or an existing service. There are a bunch of open source libraries and there are a bunch of people who do kind of, or companies to provide this as a service. The two that I know are um, here launched Darkly and Split, Split.io. So these are both companies that essentially do Boolean options as a service, right? So they, they host your feature flex in the cloud and then they have a interface, something like this, where you can just uh, create rules. They are run in the cloud. You can map users to certain conditions and they have a way to show you results. Um, oops, uh, let me show you. Yeah, this is the kind of dashboard that you might see. So you have certain tests, you see the result, you see um, there's a different version of showing the results. And then you tend to see some confidence intervals or you see whether uh, the results are actually an improvement, whether they're actually significant. You see kind of trends over time of how your confidence intervals go, get smaller, things like this. So a bunch of these services exist. You can implement this yourself. Um, and I think often you want to build on existing infrastructure. Okay, 
Do you have the sense you could run an A-B experiment if you had to? Kind of figure out how to implement this? Oh yeah, many more dashboards, right? Um, just briefly, so most people won't do power statistics. Um, so how do you know how many samples you need? So the common practice is somewhere between one and 5% of your users see the new version. Why do you pick a small number? Why not 50%? Why one to five? Maybe to reduce repercussions in case something goes seriously wrong. Yeah. So you're kind of afraid that something, your new model might not be great, right? So this is often called minimizing the blast zone. So if something goes wrong, you kind of want to reduce the impact. Um, so that's why you pick a relatively small number. And if the number is too small, you have the problem that the results might be very random, right? So uh, you might not get significant results. Um, there's also lots of technology for automate this, uh, for automating this. I don't want to go into details. This is often something that comes either with those services, they have a lot of infrastructure, and then companies like Google, Facebook, they have their own A-B testing frameworks. The concerns that they usually have are queuing, like Facebook and Google, they are running hundreds of experiments all the time, right, concurrently. So they tend to queue experiments. So they have a queue of things that they are not running everything at once. Then they stop experiments once they have confident results automatically, or they stop experiments with bad outcomes early, right? And then they have some reporting and some dashboards and so on. So you can invest a lot in kind of infrastructure around this. Um, here's a script that um, Facebook users in, in I think, yeah, this was Facebook and some internal languages where they have a whole language around uh, kind of different treatments that they're running and then probabilities about who will see what treatment and so on. So they kind of have their own domain specific language of ske scheduling and running experiments. And then you, if you run multiple experiments concurrently, you also need to think about experimental designs, are there interactions? How do you identify kind of multifactorial designs and so on, and you can automate this and I don't care about this. Um, if you're interested, I think these two papers down there are interesting. One is from Google, one is from Facebook, talking about kind of large scale infrastructure that they inv developed in-house for A-B testing. Um, I think that's interesting. I think most of the time you will probably start with something smaller or you will have an existing infrastructure available. Let's talk a little bit about the other um, things here. So something that's interesting in and often possible in machine learning are shadow releases or traffic teeing. Um, can somebody explain briefly what this is? I think Jake brought this up a couple of weeks ago as, an, as a question, but Faiti, can you go for it? Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but is it like you have two replicas, uh, uh, which are exact copies of your system and you try to send the same request which you get in actual production to the second copy as well, yep. but only one of them responds to users? Yep. You typically use the old system to respond, but you run the new system kind of in the background and just make predictions. If the prediction is different, you don't know how a user would have reacted, but you can see how often the reactions are different. Depending on what kind of telemetry you're collecting, um, this is very different, can, can be very different. So if you're predicting housing prices, it's simple because you know the ground truth later, right? Your prediction doesn't necessarily influence what happens. So if your prediction is off, um, in the background, you can track this. If your prediction actually has an influence, um, like you're deciding whether to uh, filter profanity in comments, and your model predicts something else, you don't know how the model would have done, 
right? So you can see a little bit if some if a user has complained that this should have been filtered but wasn't, you can see whether your model has fit, has not made the same mistakes. But it's kind of hard to react about the counterfactual. I think I think it was Jake, right? You brought this up with self-driving cars. Might have. I'm not sure. Um, so, so there it's very common that they drive the car around, either with the self-driving mode or either not, and they record what would the AI do in this situation, right? And then if two AIs disagree, you can see this, or if the AI disagrees with what the user actually did, you can also see this, right? So it's kind of running in shadow mode in the background. It doesn't actually do anything, uh, but you can, you can observe this. Right, so you can compare against an old model or you can compare uh, against the outcome. And in some cases, you have ground truth labels that you can get, right? like, like in the housing price prediction thing where you can actually check. You don't deploy it, but you can see how it would have done. Make sense? Doesn't work for all settings, but it's, I think, more commonly used in an AI setting than in a lot of other software settings. Um, Blue-green blue deployments, um, I think this is often just brought up as a strawman argument these days. This, is, this means you're immediately switching over all your traffic to the other treatment, but then you prepare to go back quickly. Um, the idea here is that you just have the infrastructure twice, once with the old version, once with the new version. You're switching over from blue to green, and if it's not working well, you're switching back. The thing that people are doing much more commonly is canary releases. Right, so the idea you read about this, that you're releasing this slowly, you're starting with a small percent of the, uh, the population, you're essentially running an A-B experiment every time you're releasing something. Right, and the A-B experiment can look at questions like, is accuracy degrading totally? Is the rate of errors, is the resource consumption increasing suddenly, right? And then you roll it back. Do you know where the term canary testing comes from? you want to explain it or do you mind? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, uh, back, in, back in older times, uh, they would send canaries into mines to I believe detect uh, like gas leaks or mm -hmm. something of the sort. And if the canaries returned, it would be safe for humans. And if not, um, they knew not to go in. Yes. So the one that I know is that you typically have a canary in a cage with you. And the canary dies much quicker due to gas poisoning than humans. And if the canary dies in this cage, it stops singing or somebody observes this, then this means there's gas, even if you as a human don't detect it, so you run, right? So you leave quickly. So the idea is that you have, it's similar here, you, you have something that detects something early, right, before it becomes really dangerous. Um, and canary releases are very common, I think, in rolling out changes to um, AI infrastructure, right? So it's often called under mach machine learning operations, ML ops. Um, this is what a lot of these companies are doing. There's a lot of books about this, lots of startups that will do this kind of thing for you, track this, right? Not just A-B testing, but also kind of helping you with rollouts. And again, large darkly split and these kind of companies can help with this kind of, they, they support these kind of uh, use cases all the time. And the last one here I want to bring up is chaos experiments. Um, can somebody explain briefly what those are? At least the MSE students have seen this last semester and should know. What is Chaos Monkey doing? I guess if nobody else is taking a shot. <laughs> Uh, it's basically testing in production. You bring down uh, production instances to uh, simulate a server failure and um, monitor how your system reacts to it. Right. So this is robustness testing in production typically, right? So mostly in distributed systems, you want to see how does the system react to error conditions. The classic thing 
where this comes from is Netflix taking down AWS instances randomly in production to make sure that from a user's perspective, if they're watching something, there's a seamless transition to a different instance that will just take over, right? So if you think about this, it's maybe a little bit insane. You're just shutting down servers randomly. Um, and by now, they have a lot of more tools where they just delay certain connections, where they make certain servers slow, where they um, falsify certain data, I think corrupt data intentionally and all kinds of these things. This is called the Simeon Army now, a bunch of different chaos tools. And the idea here is essentially again saying certain things are very hard to test, right? Robustness tests in distributed systems are hard. We say machine learning testing is hard, right? So you do this in production. You can't do this with unit tests that well. And this is also culture change um, for uh, chaos experiments. It means if you tell developers that you're going to kill some of their instances in production, um, they know that their error handling tests will really be tested, right? It really matters. Um, this is a cultural thing. They tried to do this um, at Uber and the developers really didn't like it, right? Why are you trying to sabotage my runtime environment? Um, turns out at Netflix, actually, random failures of AWS instances are way more common than what Chaos Monkey does. Um, but even, even if random errors happen all the time, it creates this culture of thinking about fallback mechanisms, thinking about uh, kind of backups. And I think this is interesting in an AI context as well. So if you tell developers that I'm randomly flipping your AI predictions like 1% of the time. I mean, probably 1% of your AI predictions will be wrong anyway, but maybe you are still believing that the confidence that the AI gives you is a good indication of how sure it is, right? If you just tell developers 1% of the time, I will just flip the outcome. This very much hammers home the fact that you should never trust the outcome of the machine learning component, right? So developers should really think about fallback mechanisms, the thing we talked about last week, right? Face saves and so on, and should test those as well. So I haven't read this much that people are doing this, but I think it's a very plausible strategy here also to kind of think about a very similar kind of testing and production, introducing chaos into a system with an AI component as well, right? Um, seeing how well, how robust is the system to wrong predictions. And you could run this as well. So all of these things, whenever you're experimenting in production, you want to be careful, right? So this is why you don't want to roll out something to everybody. Um, you want to minimize a blast radius. Common strategies are doing canary releases or A-B testing on a small population or chaos experiments where you're careful that you're reducing it to a certain area, right? So even if you're calling it a failure, it's not affecting all your users. It's affecting maybe 1% of your users and you can fix it pretty quickly. You can monitor it and detect it quickly. It's also common that you don't go into production before you do at least some testing before, right? So do at least some continuous integration, some runtime, some unit tests and so on. Um, and always automate things and allow for quick rollbacks. Right? So there's a lot of tooling around this. I think we'll talk about some of this, but I don't want to go too deep into this. Um, but if you're interested into DevOps, right, so there's a lot of material here, kind of continuous delivery. How can you automate these things? What kind of infrastructure? Containers, load balancers, versioning of these things. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure to kind of automatically stay, uh, scale containers. Kubernetes can do things where, they, where you can roll over containers, kind of reduce the number of one kind of containers and then increase the number of the other ones automatically. Um, and I think you really want to monitor things, right? Be careful, uh, watch what's happening, have good telemetry. Um, and that's in general about how a system helps us, but also specifically about AI components and about how people react to your AI components. All right, 
I won't have time actually for um, an exercise, but I have three more minutes to talk about this. And I don't have a lot of material. Um, we talked about this difference between software engineers and data scientists and how data scientists are often stuck in their notebooks with static data sets. So if we're pushing things into production, right, we have this infrastructure. We've, we've done A-B tests in, as software engineers for a very long time. We have all this DevOps stuff. We should think about how can we give this back to data scientists, right? So how can we make it easy for data scientists to experiment in production? How can we give them access to telemetry data? What's the kind of DevOps infrastructure that's good for data scientists? I think this is again part of the ML ops community, but it's really thinking about um, we want to help software engineers and um, operators and um, data scientists to work together, and we want some sort of tooling. Right? So kind of think about make it easy for data scientists to deploy and test models in production, which means going from a notebook to a production model, there needs to be some connection. Right, or you need to be able to push something and then this will go through automatic tests and to deployment and then some automatic uh, telemetry is collected. And then give uh, data scientists access to telemetry data. Right, so if you're collecting telemetry data anyway and you can do things like shadow execution and so on, have the data available to data scientists that if they're experimenting in a notebook, they need a new test set and so on, they can access this kind of thing. Right? And you really want to think about kind of the modeling infrastructure and the versioning of models and running of experiments that goes beyond notebooks. We're talking about versioning more later uh, when we talk about provenance, but it's very easy to have hundreds of versions of a model and then a big debugging nightmare because some model produced the wrong version, maybe in an AB experiment, maybe not. And you have even a hard time figuring out why. And so if you rejected a credit card application and it was from an important public person and it blows up in social media, do you even have a chance of figuring out which model made this pr prediction, why, and so on, right? So this is often called provenance and useful for debugging. So I think this is a good time to stop. Um, if you want, think about this exercise at some point. Um, what kind of telemetry data would you collect here? But on the other hand, you have an exercise for next week anyway. So where you can think about telemetry data and how you would collect this and how you map this. I think it's slightly easier than this one here. So what I talked about today is um, production data is really the ultimate unseen validation data, right? So we had all these problems in kind of test training, validation set splitting and kind of different problems of how to split this. If you test in production, you can't cheat. You can't accidentally overfit on something in your test data because you see in production that it won't work, right? The test quality in production simply won't be great. Um, you really want to invest in monitoring and dashboards and really think about how to, how to build infrastructure for this. Um, there are many different forms of explicit experimentation. You want to be careful about to design this. Um, some statistics are useful. I'm not going to push you far into this direction, but um, consult somebody who knows about statistics if you're building this or use some tools where this is built in and learn about how to interpret results. Um, and then think about how to make all of this available to your data scientists. That's all I have. I think there's a good time to stop.